Hello, Algebra 2. Hope you guys are having a great day. Um, today we're going to do 6.2, which is comparing functions. So we've done functions a lot already. Um, we're just going to do more stuff with them. So um, today we're just going to be comparing different functions using different representations. And then we're also going to be um, looking at com function rates and like how quickly things go to infinity which is super exciting. So, let's start. This first example is about um, cars in a parking lot at a high school. Um, and it's on a Saturday, right? So usually there aren't too many cars on a Saturday at a high school. Um, and you can't tell the exact number of cars because we don't know what the axis is. Um, but it's important to look at what the x-axis is and what the y-axis is. And in this case, the x-axis um, is time and the y-axis is number of cars. And like I said, we don't know the units on the number of cars, but really we're just kind of like trying to come up with a story of what happened on this Saturday. So early in the morning and there's nobody there, which makes sense, right? And that's this, you know, right here at zero. Um, nobody was at the school right and then all of a sudden at noon there were a certain number of cars and we don't know how many so but maybe there was an event happening maybe a, a soccer game or um or maybe a study session and there were three people meeting up or you know whatever we don't know um and then that ended right and then most of the cars left or all of them left and somebody else came in um and then we had a, a very small number of cars um maybe just kind of like from lunchtime or something and people left and went home. Um, and then again, a little bit later, we have an, more cars. So another event, maybe um, another game or maybe like a musical <laughs> or a play or something, right? Um, and so that's, and that was only a couple hours long. Um, and so pe the people who came, they came for that event, they stayed for a certain number of hours, and then they all left and went home. Um, and so that's kind of what they're asking you to do when they say interpret um, the graph. You know, you can kind of just like give a little story of what happened that day. Okay, now problems like the second one um, can get a little tricky if you leave. So we have two different, well, let's actually look at the problem first. You have two people opening two different accounts, um, but on the same day right um, neither one has a principal amount neither one initially deposits anything um, but then they deposit a certain amount every week and the same amount meaning it's linear it's growing linearly um, but the difference between the two one is being represented as a graph one's being represented as a table um, and it's really hard to compare the two if they're in two different forms. And so what really helps um, is to make both of them on a graph, um, actually even the same graph, because that'll help you see the actual scenario and what's happening, um, or put both in a table. Um, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to go ahead and on mic savings, I'm going to also include John's savings. So uh, Mike's savings is going to be in orange because all of his dots are in orange. So, you know, that's his, um, that's Mike's account. And then John, I'm going to have in green. So I'm just going to plot the points that we already have from John. So we know after one week, um, John has $25. So one week, $25. That's about there, um, if you can see that little tiny green dot. Then after three weeks, we have $86. So three weeks, $86 is like there. Okay, so then you can continue this. I'm not going to make you watch me put dots on there. Okay, so there's now that we have both graphs on there, we can look at a couple different things. One is the average rate of change, um, which is really like your on it. It's how much you increase on average. And so um, you might, in this case, you would look at John's account, right? And you'd see that, okay, over the span of eight weeks, 
he increased from $25 to $204. And sorry, that's a, over a span of seven weeks, actually. So John's average rate of change, which is like a y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, um, your average rate of change might be different for different parts of the graph, and that's okay. Um, but in this case, the linear graph is exactly, it's going to be the same thing. Okay, so John's average rate of change is 179 over 7. Then we can do the same thing for the other account. So for Mike, his max amount is 124, and he went from $20 to $124 in a span of, let's see, from one week to five weeks, okay? So then we can do the same thing for Mike. So in this case, Mike's average rate of change is 26. Um, and then it asks, um, explain what the rates represent in the situation. Um, and this is how much per week, um, on average, each person is depositing into their account. So. John, on average, is depositing $25.57 into his account, and Mike is depositing, on average, $26 in his account. Now, sometimes it's important to look at the max and min as well. Um, and they didn't ask you to do this, but I just want to show you so that you have a heads up that it might be coming, right? If Because Mike is increasing faster than John, right, he's depositing more money in his account, there will be a day, someday, as long as they stay at this rate, there will be a day that Mike has more in his account that John does, okay? And at that point, right, um, here's your Mike graph, and it has a slightly higher slope than the John graph, right? And But John starts out higher, right? And so eventually, sorry, please excuse my horrible drawing, but at some point they're going to cross and Mike will overcome John's uh, amount in his account. So just things to think about. Um, uh, and so sometimes it's important to look at max and mins as well. Um, when you're comparing two sets of data. It just depends on what they're asking for. Okay, next problem is comparing end behavior because um, eventually you'll be having to look at, you know, maybe two different bank accounts and comparing who's going to have more money in the end or whose account grows faster. Um, and so we just, I gave you a couple examples, um, two functions, y equals uh, negative x squared, which is the first one, and then uh, g of x, which is 4 times log of x, base 10, right, common log. Um, and so it says compare the end behaviors. And if you remember from a while ago, um, end behavior is like, what happens at the tails? So as x goes to positive infinity, right, if I go really far in that direction, what's happening to y? Um, and in this case, for problem, um, for f of x, right, um, we can say as x goes to positive infinity, f of x goes to, and then we look at the graph and we say, oh, where is f of x going? Oh, look at that. It's going down to negative infinity, right? It's going down. So we would say f of x approaches negative infinity. And then we also want to say what happens as x goes to negative infinity, the other direction. I don't know which way you're looking, but that's okay. All right, <laughs> anyways. So we can do the same thing, but looking at as x goes to negative infinity, y is also going down, right? The function is also going down on this side to negative infinity. So we would then say, and as x goes to negative infinity, f of x goes to pos uh, negative infinity as well. Okay, so that would be the first function's end behavior. For g of x, as x goes to positive infinity, y, right, if we follow the graph, is eventually going to go up really high and eventually go to infinity. Um, so we would say, as x goes to infinity, g of x goes to infinity. 
Now for log, this one gets a little funny because I can't really say as x goes to negative infinity because the function is not defined there. But as the function, or as x gets really close to zero, on the other hand, I can talk about what's happening there. So as the function gets really close to zero, um, as, as x gets really close to zero, the function gets really, really close to negative infinity. Um, and something to look at is the rate at which these things go to positive or negative infinity. And I don't know if this is easy to tell or not, but like this, the log function goes down to negative infinity really fast. Like it goes from zero to negative infinity in one x value. On the other hand, it takes an infinite number of x values for the left function to get to, po to negative infinity. So the f of x goes to negative infinity slower than g of x. Just thought I'd throw that out there. And Dory and Marlin are getting married. <laughs> so this is very exciting. But they need to plan their wedding. And they're looking at places to get food for the wedding. And they're trying to compare clam chowder catering and the Dungeness crab cookery. Now, usually in real life situations like this, okay, it's not really real life, but kind of real life. Okay, <laughs> when um, you're getting catering and things like that done or renting a car, there's always like a flat rate that you have to pay no matter what. So maybe it's like 150 bucks down and then you also have to pay per mile or you have to pay per number of hours that you're using the car and the number of hours that you're getting the catering done. Um, so in this case, right, we've got two different um, companies, right, and we want to compare the two and we want to talk about what the y-intercept is and what the slope-intercept is um, and what the average um, the average rates are. So for the y-intercept, um, I would actually graph it. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to graph both of them on the same set of axes. Okay, here's a little graph of the two, and you can kind of tell that um, the purple graph is generally higher than the blue. Um, and so we also want to look at the actual average rates, right? And that's kind of your um, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 to kind of see how on average, how much on average it's increasing. Um, and it doesn't necessarily, you don't want to pick like the first two values to average, um, especially if it's clearly not a perfect linear function. Um, however, um, you know, you can pick like the highest y value and the lowest y value, um, or you can pick, I don't know, whatever. Just, you know, make sure that you're, you have enough information and you're concluding appropriately. So for this one, for clam chowder, let's do the average um, as uh, highest minus lowest uh, y values. Let's do, so 304 minus 200 all over uh, 7 minus 3. Okay, so that'll get us our average value for the clam chowder catering. For the Dungeness crab cookery, <clears throat> let's do, um, for our average value, we'll do the highest y value again. So 330 minus the low, which is uh, 251. And then um, we can compare those average rates. So with this, you can tell that the average um, per hour cost for um, the clam chowder is higher than the Dungeness, but we already saw that on the graph, Dungeness is higher in general, and that means it has a higher starting value. Um, and that's where the y-intercept comes in handy. So like if you take an approximate line, right, kind of like um, a line of best fit, right, and you're to look at that, Right, your y-intercept for the Dungeness is around 200-ish. Eh, so that means without hours at all, it costs about $200. And for the clam chowder, it costs about 120 or so. And so um, the starting cost for clam chowder is lower, but the average rate 
per hour is higher. Um, and so you would have to figure out what is more economical.